some visitors from out of the country. And so if you're from out of the country, just um, unmute and just tell us where you're from. I'm originally from Prague, but I've been living in England since 87. Thank you. And just Ava. Who else? Anybody from out of, the, out of the country? Anybody else? All right. And what about um, different parts of the United States? So do we have anyone from the southern part of the state? That would be Janet and from Carolina. No, thank you very much. And Diane from South Carolina. Thank you. Anybody from the West Coast? Hi, Katie from uh, LA. Thank you. And how about any, anybody from the Midwest? I'm Dinah, I'm from Minneapolis. Thank you, Minneapolis. What about the Northern, way, way up north, uh, Canada or Maine? Anybody from those areas? And the rest of you are on the Northeastern coast, I'm assuming, yes? Emma, where are you from? I saw you raise your hand earlier. I'm also from North Carolina. North Carolina, okay. Welcome everyone. So just a few um, housekeeping. When we are, um, when I'm speaking or when someone's speaking, you keep, your, keep yourself on mute so we don't get any background feedback. Um, so we can keep that. And then, um, my uh, co-person who's going to help me through this is Justine. She's the Associate Director of Kirkridge Retreat Center, Justine Johnson. So she's going to keep me on track. All right. So let's begin. I'm going to start to share my screen, Justine. So let me pull up my information here. And everyone let me know, can you see this clearly? Yes, we can yes. see that. Crossing Boundaries, excellent. So just a little bit of background, if you don't know, um, my name is Juanita Curtin. I have a MFA from Guided College. I'm a poet and writer. I've published quite a few pieces of individual poems and in journals and magazines. Um, I have a book out that was published by print, um, Finishing Line Press is available online um, right now. The book will be shipped in August and will be available on Amazon, I think, in coming in August. Um, so it's called Letters to My Father. And um, I live in Northeast Pennsylvania. I'm a board member of Kirkridge Retreat Center. I also work for the PA Department of Education and I'm living here with my spouse, Carol. And um, I love the work. I love uh, workshops and connecting with people and writers from across the world. So we're going to explore um, crossing boundaries and we're going to get into writing for social justice and what's that, what's that all about. And I think we need to know as artists and um, who are writers, it doesn't matter if you are a dancer or you're a musician, it's important for our art to speak out um, against any kind of injustice, be it social, racial, um, economic injustices across the world. Um, um, and also, I just wanted to double check with my counterpart. Um, Justine, are we taping this? Yes, we are. Oh, okay, great, thank you. All right, so let's get into introduction. So what is social consciousness? And so it simply means that you're aware of the problems that exist in society. And we're gonna have a bunch of creative prompts that will inspire you to think about those problems more critically, deeper. And looking at white people who become likely to live and work in the world, um, an expectation that their needs are readily met but people of color move through the world knowing their needs are on the margins. Recognizing this means recognizing there are gaps that exist. Um, and not to take it personal, um, any discomfort that you feel to use as an excuse to disengage. It, you, all of you are here because you want to be engaged. We want to have discussion and we want to write about some of the issues that have come up. 
And it's interesting because these issues existed for a long, 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 long time. It's not something new. Uh, I just think that there are more and more people who are conscious and aware and want to make critical change at this time. So I think that's really, really important. Um, so, Learn to listen. So if you have feelings of guilt or defensiveness, they are common responses. And it's really ultimately counterproductive. Rather than centering on your own feelings of discomfort, center your feelings on people of color and evaluate what to do in, with this information. You have learned to listen, when to amplify, and when to speak up. And it's interesting because my son um, and my granddaughter is biracial. Not my son is not biracial, my granddaughter is biracial. And it is so, I become so aware of the fact that even though my son is very, very dark and my granddaughter is very, very light and her mother is white, she will not be seen as a white child. She'll be seen as a black woman in this world. It's the same thing that happened with, as you notice, with Barack Obama. He, his mother is white, his father is black, but he's known or seen as a black man, not as a, a man with a, a, a mixed, he's mixed, but we're seen in the world as a person of color. And those words and those anxious, those, those words sometimes make you feel uncomfortable when you don't know where to put yourself. Are you biracial? Are you black? But you're mixed, so you have a white mother. Where does that? Where where do you fall in? And it's interesting. We have to discuss this with our kids. We have to talk to our children about this all the time, all the time. So I think that it's important for us to listen to each other. So I, in wondering, as I'm speaking in terms about listening, and I hear the silence of you listening to me. The first two slides that I brought up, what is going through your mind? What, what are your thoughts right now? What are some of your feelings? Does anybody feel uncomfortable? Or do, everyone is just I feel like, back I listening. feel like, let's get to it. You know, ahead, there's David. a lot to talk about. We so you need say, to talk and listen and exchange. Bring it on. <laughs> so David, you said listen. So get to what? What do exactly? What do you mean? Say get to it. Well, get to the, get to the stuff that makes us uncomfortable. <laughs> That's hard hard to deal with, no matter what your color is. So can yeah. can you give me an example of something that would maybe make you feel uncomfortable? Uh, yeah, I guess, let's see, um, something from the weekend, actually, to make it fresh. Uh, my father-in-law asked me, actually, he's 92, mm -hmm. uh, obviously from a different time frame and set of uh, operations. Mm -hmm. uh, he will remind us on occasion that he's never really known a Black person. Mm -hmm. uh, conversation came about on the weekend, and he asked me at one point if I thought we would ever get past this kind of... Uh, mistreatment of black people. And I said, uh, yeah, I, I kind of think we will. I, I have some hopefulness about it. And he kind of shook his head and said, yeah, I don't believe that. And, and it's interesting, you said that he's uh, 90 something years old. Oh yeah, and 92. Is, and still in tune with what's going on in the world. He is, he is. And, and, had, and had enough um, courage to ask that question. Yeah, so that, totally. That is, that is possibility right there. I, I, I agree, totally. <laughs> I, I was kind of floored that he asked me, actually. I was like, whoa, this is, com this is coming from, his nickname's Moose. <laughs> uh -huh. Uh -huh. This is coming from Moose. <clears throat> Thank you, David, for sharing. And anyone else is feeling any changes Eva, or questions? Eva has her hand up. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I, I'm not able to see everyone. You're right. Uh, just call on them for me, uh, Justine. Ava, go ahead. Um, 
Well, I find this fascinating because I always had a problem with somebody who is biracial. Why are they not white? Why are they black? And I had a discussion with an American friend who couldn't understand what's the problem. And he then told me that anybody who walks into a pub and looks, people think that black that is black. Well, I just, being a European, I don't see it that way. I mean, I, when I know somebody who is half Vietnamese, half Czech, I wouldn't say they're Vietnamese or they're Czech, they're both. Uh, I'm three quarters Jewish and quarter Czech. <laughs> which part is, well, I live in England. I, I don't know why, why is the one half, is it because of the discrimination that the one half uh, somehow takes over? Is it because uh, the, when you have a biracial, when you have a black part, you treat it as a black, whether you want to or not? Is that the reason? Well, if you know the history of the United States in terms of the measurement of color in your blood, if you have an eighth of a black blood, which is no such thing as black blood, in oh. your body, you're considered a person of color. Um, the, but, the Nazis did the same with the Jews, actually. Uh, okay, okay. So I think that that goes across the board for, as you just said, for Jews also. Um, mm -hmm. And but I think that also because the color of your um, your skin is the first thing people see normally. Yes. Unless you're so light that, as they say, people are passing and yeah. they don't acknowledge the fact that they are a person of color. That's different. Okay. But I appreciate the, the, the question. I, I want to say that I, I tend to agree with David's father that we will never get past all of this. And I'm not trying to be cynical about it. It's, it's just something that seems to be inherent in our society. And there's so many that work really hard to perpetuate it on both sides that it seems a almost insurmountable task to overcome, to reach a point of harmony. Now, mm -hmm. idealistically, it would be very nice if we could get there, but I don't know that we ever will. Now, um, so I think that one of the things that we have to be aware of is um, looking at ourselves and how we then approach this whole issue, and then also looking at the fact that the systematic uh, racial injustices are built into our systems and are legalized. And I think right. that what's happening now, if people are looking at that and saying, okay, we need to change some of the laws, some of the restrictions um, that are that are in our system to make it uh, to, to to make the ultimate uh, the ultimate how would I want to say this the, the the comfort level a little easier for people to to deal with, and I think that that's something that we that we're working towards mm -hmm. that putting systems in place. For, for equality <laughs> and equity. Okay, so I have an exercise. Hope everybody has their pen and paper and pencil. And we're gonna do some writing. Well, not a lot of writing in the beginning. We're gonna choose some words. So I'm gonna give you a list of words in the next slide. And you're, you have to choose five words from this list and you write them down in a straight line on your paper. And then next to each word, you're gonna write your first thoughts, one or two words, three words, or a sentence until your list is completed. Now, I just explained, does everyone understand what the directions were? Yes, just nod your head, yes? Okay, so the next slide, gonna have, these are all the words. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. There's 40 words. Take your time and look at those words. Choose five words. And next to each word, write down some of the first thoughts 
that come to mind that is connected to those words. And let me. Juanita, how much time would you like for this? Just um, so we know how quickly we have to move. Yeah, that's cool. Um, it's 3.15, so um, two or three minutes. It's 3.17, so 3.18. And the 3.19, I'm sorry. <laughs> two minutes. Okay, it's about two minutes. So let's hear some words that you wrote down and the thoughts that went with them. And um, Justine, if you can help me with um, choosing members who either sure. raise their hand or we just go around the room. Maybe we just go around the room. How's that? And you can just share your five, your five words and what you wrote next to them. All right. Yeah, yeah I can see everyone. So if okay. someone would like to begin, it's also optional. Um, we'd love to hear your voice in this. Yes. So we invite that in. And if, I saw David's hand. You want to go yep. ahead? I was just going to say hinges first. Yeah. Go ahead. Hinch. Okay. Uh, black, uh, a color, a culture, an identity an accusation, a sentence, not like an English sentence, like a sentence that gets mm -hmm. laid on you. Uh, on violence, I wrote, uh, possible outcome made me think of Langston Hughes, dream deferred. Uh, protest can be endangering us versus them. Uh, Democracy question mark, not necessary. Injustice, intrinsic part of legal system. Thank you, David. Thank you. Next. You wanna raise your hand. Okay, so Eva and then Katie. Uh, can I just, before I start, ask, is there any possibility that we could always see the person who's talking? Because I can't. I just can see. Two. You, you have to click on your side. Um, okay. Yeah. Uh, I'll try. Yeah. You have to click on your side to, if, if you want to view. You have to put in the view possibilities. All right. Thank you. So I've got respect. I never understood what respect meant 
till I was about 50. And then I started not letting people behaving disrespectfully to me or to others. Well, I tried, sometimes they stop. Female, double whammy is in discrimination. Silence can be as harmful. I try not to be silent when I see somebody, something I don't like, but then I find it difficult to be silent anyway. Um, opportunity, everybody should have the same opportunity. Let's just try. Entitlement, yes. Feeling that a person has a right to privilege without having to earn the right. It is stupid, but there are many stupid people around. Thank you, Ava. Who else? It was Katie, then Janet. Okay, go ahead. Uh, entitlement, me, white folk, unknowing ease and comfort. Grief, ongoing, generational, traumatizing, so much loss. Reconciliation, hope, the yearning of the heart. Opportunity, is this all we can ask? A fair, truly equitable chance to pursue, to dream, to become? Reparations, yes. Okay, thank you, Katie. Janet and Arlene. All right. Okay. Um, COVID-19, opportunity for inwardness, reach out to the world through Zoom. Violence, that's a whole other take on that, can be a prayer, equalizing, accepting, peaceful. When we're in sounds together, I was thinking. Um, racism, everyone is racist, but everyone doesn't have to be unconscious of this. A challenge to overcome, to take action, to change. Zoom, window to the world, opportunity to reach out, uh, a chance for presence with others. Great, thank you very much. And then we have, any, any, anyone else there? Arlene, did you wanna go? And then if you want, you can raise your hand and start yes. naming. Well, I chose a gender inequality. Hunger should not be. Injustice on many levels for many people. Opportunity, now is the time. White, how do I contribute to injustice as a white person? Thank you, Arlene. Sandy, you're next. Um, it had life, but I put live. And I'm aware of the energy of the both sides of this. It reminds me of COVID in a way. I was thinking about um, how, to, how to produce antibodies to reduce the side of the illness and um, something proactive to strengthen the side of what has separated us for so long. Um, in reparations, make amends to say sorry in a meaningful way to have a heart change without it just being um, trivialous words of reparations. So to have meaningful reconciliation. And today as I was looking at the news, or listening to it last night, it was said, um, everyone wear the mask because the pandemic is in play. There was no discussion among some people. And I wondered what it would look like for their statement to be not, no more discussion on ra racism, to just state that it is. And the, and the people who are speaking and, and who are protesting to just make the statement and that we begin to live like that. And just wondering if that, that might be radical, a radical way of intellectually stating we will live that way and therefore we do. And that way we may better be able to non-debate it with uh, those in fear and illogical and prone to negativity that are going to be skewed that way anyway. That's not a few words, but that's what I was thinking. 
Thank you, Sandra. Thank you very much. All right, any, is anyone else? Sally. Okay. Exhausting. The greatest danger to hope and change. Female, a huge part of the solution. <laughs> White, a great marketing. Equality, not enough, we need equity. Education, our best hope. Thank you. So um, I'll just read mine real quick. I don't know, Justine or Jean, if you wrote anything down. I wrote forgiveness. I wrote maybe. I wrote always. Respect. I want it now. Opportunity. I want it now. Reparation. You owe me. Protest. Stand up. Sit down. So we're going to continue on. I thank you for those responses. And uh, oh, we need to next slide. So I'm not sure how much discussion you've had. But when people of color speak to your experience of oppression, it's important for white people not to dominate the conversation or question those experiences. You can use your privilege to amplify those voices, share the work and perspectives of people of color on social media, credit colleagues of color for ideas. This not only helps marginalized people reach that audience, but also helps spread the message from sources rather than through the lens of a white person. That being said, there are always also times when white people should speak up. It's not fair to burden people of color by making them always take the lead on anti-bias work or intervening when they something often offensive is said or done. If you hear racist remarks, speak up. If you see opportunities to educate fellow white people about race, do so. As an ally, your privilege can be a tool to reach people who may be more likely to listen to you, relate to your journey, and understanding your relationship to race and white privilege. So educate yourself. And I'll give you a good example of this. So behind me, I have a neighbor and she and her husband, they're white and they have a young child, I think 11. Across the street from me is lots and like of acres and it belongs to another white person. To left of me is a black man and to the right of me is another white person. We have a lot of acres around our land. So, so it's about, I have two acres, some probably have five acres, somebody else has three acres, across the street is six acres. So we have a lot of space between us. And, um, Last two weeks ago, my neighbor in the back, white person, came over and she was asking about what was happening in this world and wanted uh, Carol, because she has a lot of re relationship with my spouse, Carol, because they do a lot of gardening together. And we started talking about some of the things. And I said to her, I said, well, have you discussed this with your daughter? She's 11. She never spoke to her daughter. She never asked her question. And I'm sure her daughter must have some kind of feelings. She's a young child, a young girl who's in school, has classmates. So my, my, my reason for bringing this up is to look at yourself in your environment where you live, in your home, in your family, in your, with your neighbors. Begin to take that courage walk across the street or next door and talk to them. Um, this is so, so important. Um, I have another person who's a teacher and mentor of mine, and there are four women in, in the, uh, who are siblings. Two are working towards social justice and believe in what's happening now. And two, want to join number 45 and don't believe what's happening now. And so there's strife within the family. David brought up how his a 92-year-old father asked the question and took that courage step to even ask a question. So one of my thoughts that I want to throw out to you how many of you have been able to ask a question and to educate yourself or your 
spouse or your family members, your neighbor about what's happening in the world today? How many of you have been able to take that journey? I see David, Janet, Katie. Okay, Katie, why don't you give us uh, an example of that journey? Um, I was talking to my mom. Uh, the favorite thing she loves to do is play cards, and it's been very challenging to do that socially distanced. But that's when we have our best conversation over Remy 500. <laughs> and it was shortly after George Floyd's murder. And um, I just asked her what, what she thought. And she is someone who would never typically say something racist, um, who I think tries to have a good heart, but she's an 88 year old. And she used to say, well, when we grew up in Montebello, I never knew any black folk. Um, I said, well, mom, you know, is it because black folk had to leave by sunset? <laughs> so mm. that, that might be part of it. Um, and we just had this conversation and she, for the first time said, you know, maybe there's something deeper going on that I need to pay attention to. Um, maybe, maybe it's so ingrained in our police system that we need to remake how everything is done. Um, so, I don't, I'm not going to take on the mantle of courage. I opened the conversation, but it was the first time her taking on a perspective that I had never heard her take on before. Thank you sharing that, Katie. That's so important, um, what you just said. So now we're hearing perspective from David and Katie as to the generation that came before them that might have been blind or less conscious and now they're having that conversation, so the gap is closing. Thank you. Who else wants to share? Someone we haven't heard from. Okay, Emma. Yeah, I recently reconnected with uh, someone I went to high school with who is a police officer in Raleigh, North Carolina. And it's actually been um, a really like, challenging journey. Um, we were friends in high school, but haven't really stayed in touch and we got reconnected through some friends and he has asked to, to have some conversation and we are in really different places about like what we believe about things. And it's not, it has not been particularly comfortable to try to talk with him. Um, and, but it's, I mean, I think it's opening my eyes and there's moments where I actually have felt perplexed just like why he wants to have conversation at all because I pretty much disagree with almost everything he shares or we've had some like pretty intense dialogue um, or there's been some severe critique on my end, I think of, of his work. Um, but I think I felt encouraged that like he's open to having dialogue and that I'm also growing as a result of that dialogue um, because I think in my work, I, I have, I tend to want to make it, sorry, my phone is ringing, like very cut and dry um, of like writing off particular people who are involved in oppressive systems. And I think conversing with him has, is forcing me to open my eyes to the, to like the humanity of all of us, like calling him into a different path, but also seeing him as a fellow beloved person. Um, I don't know if that makes sense, but it's been a really challenging conversation for me as someone who's normally quite, I think has been quite compliant and always very obedient to realize, oh, actually this is a space where I need to use my voice. So Emma, thank you for sharing that. And so you are using the power of listening on this very challenging journey with this young man. And he's able to open up. So he is also on a journey. And so even though it feels like different paths, actually, I think it's like parallel. And um, being able to look at a, where a, the bridge is between the two of you. And um, I think that what you just said is very, very powerful, not only for you, but for him also. 
Yes. Okay. Anyone else dying to share? Because then I'm going to go on a little bit. So here we are again. So it's okay to question a willingness to be involved, to educate yourself. And even though there's lots of books and articles, you know, I put this in here, you know, just because I think it's important to have, to be able to read. But there are some, there's so much stuff out there about racial injustice and social change and um, ways to educate yourself. You have to pick and choose what you're going to be reading. You really, really do. Um, and I think that that's important for not only people of color, but for everyone. Because there's a lot of information. And especially today with um, the internet. And when I looked yesterday, um, when I did that workshop for 110 women, it covered South Africa, Europe, every state in the United States. We were all on together at the same time. And so there's a lot of information that we can um, surround ourselves with. But just be critical about that. Um, one of the things I, I have a hard time doing is being called upon to be the spokesperson for a person who is feeling racial injustice. But then again, I also need to use my voice and my art to speak out and to support um, my fellow humankind, not just people of color, but everybody. I have close friends who, who are white, but I don't see them as white. <laughs> they're, they're wonderful, beautiful people. And their color disappears for me because they able to get it. They get it. And once you get it and you're connected, that lens that you look through in terms of color, it doesn't exist anymore. Um, and not saying that you should go out into the world and you say, oh, I don't see color. It's not about that. It's different when you're able to connect. It's different. So I just wanted to, to kind of put that out there. Um, so again, share what you learn. Be courageous. Have conversations. Circle conversations. And it's risky. It's hard. It's difficult. But this time demands you to stand up. Or as John Lewis said, sit down. If you need to sit down. So I'm not going to go over this right here because we are above that. So this is what we're going to do. So those are some of my words. I had chosen different words before I even started this. So when I first wrote my uh, PowerPoint out, I chose these words, history, reconciliation, opportunity, respect, and rage. And then doing a workshop with you, other words came to mind, which is the ones I read with you a little while ago. So we're going to have a writing exercise, and we're going to do that right now. So look at the words below. And if you are a white female, you can't choose female and white. You have to choose two or more words from below from a perspective other than yourself. So if you're a white male, and you live in an urban area, maybe you're a Native American and you're a conservative, or you're a child, or you're a Democrat. You're different, maybe if you're able, you're differently abled. If you're black, maybe you're brown. Maybe you're young. If you're old, you're gonna be young. So ch choose two, two words from this list, and we're gonna, I'm gonna hear them out loud right now. Write them down next to or underneath your five words that you chose.
and I'm going to do the same exercise. I have to, I didn't do this one before. Okay, how are we doing? Everyone get down at least two words. I'm gonna start and then we're gonna go around the room. So everybody's gonna chime in. So my words are, I'm white and I'm rich. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> okay, let's go around the room. Justine, are you doing this exercise? Yep, I did uh, homeless and Asian. Homeless and Asian. Okay, Ava, what did you choose? Under, black, there you go. Black and gay, and I'm a man. So black I'm and gay, and you're a man. Okay, Evelyn, what did you choose? Urban and homeless. Oh, ur urban and homeless. Okay, David, what about you? I went with uh, homeless and poor. Homeless and poor. Emma, how about you? I chose homeless Native American. Homeless Native American. Katie, how about you? What did you choose? Poor Indigenous. I'm sorry, what was the first one? Uh, poor and Indigenous. Poor and Indigenous. Okay. Elaine. Unmute. Unmute, Elaine. I can't hear you. Poor and different, difficulty enabled, able, differently able. Differently abled. Okay. Uh, Katie, Ka uh, Kathleen, sorry. Um, I chose young and rural. Young and rural. Diane Petty, wait. I chose gay child. Gay child. All right. Uh, Diane with a D. Oh, no. D is it Dana? Diana? No, it's Diane Dana. Dana. Dino. It's Dinah. Um, Dino. I'm Republican and rural. Republican and rural. Okay, Beth. Uh, can't hear you. Go ahead. Uh, urban, black, and rich. Urban, black, and rich. Okay. Uh, Sandra. Child and Asian. Uh, what's the first one? Child. Child. Oh, Asian child. Okay. I don't know who the person is on Galaxy Tab S3. Who's that? It's Tina. Tina. It's oh, Tina Jean. Hey, Tina. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh, I'm Indigenous Native American. Indigenous Native American. Jean, are you doing this one? Yes. Yep. I'm young, black, and urban. Young, black, and urban. Arlene. I'm child and poor. Child and poor. Janet. I'm gay, young, and male. Okay. J Joni. That's shy. <laughs> I took Native American, young, and male. Okay, and Sally. Indigenous, end of life. All right, so did I get everyone? Yes. I think so. Okay, so this is going to be your writing exercise. You got 30 minutes. So the words that you chose, I felt discussion wrong. Okay, I'll get that right. <laughs> <laughs> the words that, I, that you chose, um, the first five words, with your two, you're gonna now write a poem, a paragraph, a thought, of whatever you wanna write for 30 minutes. That would include a perspective of the choice of person that you are. So I'm a rich white person and I'm gonna write about forgiveness, respect, opportunity, reparations, and protests. I'm gonna write from that perspective. So whatever, you're, whatever you chose to be, if you're an indigenous person and use your five words and write from that perspective. And here are some thoughts, and you don't have to use these, but these are some guiding thoughts. What does justice look like moving forward? There's never a convenient time to dismantle institutional racism. Why do I have to forgive when you continue to hurt me? Where do we go from here? Nine minutes, nine things you wanna see change. Choose action of observation. What is the American way? I went to a dark place and almost forgot my humanity. 
What are your thoughts on violence? Where is hope? What does it look like? What does it feel like? So now it's 346. So we have 30 minutes to write. I'm going to mute myself. So that was um, crossing the boundary of where we stood in our own space and time and imagining what it would be like to step across that boundary into another place, another space, another shoe, another thought, expanding where that boundary is, expanding our boundaries. And so what I want to do, and we don't have a lot of time, but I would like maybe to share maybe two minutes um, of each, because we have about, what, 15 people, 18 people? Yeah, so that's not a lot of time. It takes us right to 4.30. Wow. So maybe just one minute, <laughs> but maybe to, can we just share out a few thoughts that came up for you? Um, and don't take a lot of time. Let's do, you know, one or two minutes each, okay? All right, so let's go around the room real quick. And um, do you see some hands up? Let's start to share. Yeah, again, so this is optional, invitational. We'd love yeah. to hear your voices. Um, one hand is up first. Yep, Johnny. Johnny. Go first. Yeah, just a short snippet because we don't want to take time away from everybody else. Go ahead. Tina Jean. Okay. A 20 year old Native American man. My native name is Running Bear in our language. My teachers and school friends, both Indian and white, call me Sam. Unlike my white school friends, I have no entitlement, which I learned means that when hardship incidents happen in my life as opposed to a white person's life, I cannot be sure that the color of my skin or my heritage has not created or complicated that hardship. Life for me is hard. We live in Pueblo. Our homes are at best modest and at worst a little more than shacks, um, et cetera, et cetera. So it goes, I go on and talk about what it would be like to be a black, I'm sorry, Native American young person. Thank you. Thank you. So um, Joni, um, how hard was it to you to jump over to that boundary? Not so hard because my my deceased partner was very interested in Native American life and stuff. So we had visited Pueblos and seen how the people live. And uh, so I, I was more conversant with that than I would be if I picked a, a, you know, an Asian person or a person of another ilk. Thank you very much. Um, the next person was listed, was it Tina Jean is next? Yep. You have one minute. Go ahead, Tina Jean, unmute. People in America choose to believe all have freedom. Wait, 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 wait. What, what, what did you choose? What were your two, what bound? Indigenous Native American. Oh, okay, great. He was getting ready to come up. I was getting ready. I was trying to go as fast as I could. Sorry. So people in America choose to believe all have freedom in this country. I'm outraged to consider their idea of equality. Have they ever considered the mindset of Native Americans? We are the indigenous peoples of this country, yet we were systematically removed when those with greater power overtook all that we hold dear. I know the focus today is on our current climate of black lives matter. I'm not saying they don't matter. However, what about us? White people made it their priority to systematically destroy our way of life, kill our families and steal our land. It is more than exhausting to even attempt to consider how best to repair the injustice against my people. I'd like a place at that table to receive justice, re respect, and reparations for us. How do we achieve this? Where do we even begin? Thank you, Tina Jean. I love the statement, what about us? What about us? That's what stays with me there. Who else wants to share? Uh, Hinch, then Eva. Okay, go ahead. Mute. Am I on now? Yes, yep. go ahead. Uh, homeless and poor. Uh, it's just a t shirt, an iceberg identity. Sit with me a spell. Help yourself to garden salad and please pass the blackened chicken. I focus not on injustice. I can't afford to. You see, I once was violent, 
but the gotchas got me. Thus, I have been experienced by hard education. I do wish people like you would protest in my stead. I'm so tired, but I am ashamed not of being homeless and poor. Thank you. That, I, I enjoyed hearing that piece in terms of the shamelessness of being homeless and yeah. poor. Shamelessness. Thank you. Who's next? Who was, was it Ava who was next? Justine, Ava, Ava go ahead, Ava. I wrote about two pages, so I just uh, No, just the first I, couple. I, I, I chose gay black. Gay and black. so I just read the last two sentences. I am a gay black man in the UK. My white female friend asked me, what out of those three characteristics is the main most important one? I don't really know. I think that's good. My parents, when they came, met terrible racism. No dogs, no Irish, no blacks. In this country, it was terrible. I am probably just lucky. Aha. Uh -huh. Just lucky. How was that to, to write from that perspective? Well, I think uh, that even somebody who is as optimistic as the character I wrote about and who is quite happy and uh, feels that nothing is a problem uh, encountered uh, certain things. He just takes them as not really important. And I think uh, he finds that uh, he's lucky, but I think it's partly because, uh, well, he's lucky to be the, the personality he is, that he doesn't take it badly. Okay, thank you. Anybody else wants to share? All right, Emma, okay. go ahead. Emma and then, and then Kathy, go ahead. Okay, um, so I did um, a homeless Native American. Okay. Calling it a letter to white Anglo-Saxons. <laughs> Have I ever been anything other than homeless, at least since you got here? The creatures were all my home. We were all each other's home. But somewhere across the sea, those of you with pale skin had become unhomed. You see it as something to possess, to take, to undo, rather than a womb which is always given, which is held as gift of breath, of water, and blood. But blood, my people saw it as the liquid of reverence, and you saw it as a game. It wasn't just a trail of tears, it was a trail of blood. And for you, it was just lines on a page. Thank you. And so, unhomed stay with me. How did, how did you feel in terms of getting into that character, into that crossing that boundary? How was that for you? It was uncomfortable. I think I felt hesitant to like speak for anyone else. <laughs> Um, like that feels weird yeah. to try to do that, but there's a sense of I'll never understand fully. Uh -huh. Um, but like trying to imagine is this exercise in discomfort that feels important. Thank you, Emma. Thank you for that coverage. Okay, Kathy, you're next. Did I say hunger brought me back to the land running from the everyday violence? the numbness that ripped my self-respect and sours my senses, safe here, unburdened, a promise of green. Did I say hope for freedom at last, freedom now? Did I dare to feel real hunger for rich dark earth to plant something as powerful as a seed? Come my friends, let us not pretend that we can leave the bonds behind, a common ground, and storms that rouse the thirst for justice. Thank you. And the words that you chose, the characters? Hunger, hunger violence, respect, power, freedom. Whoa, it took a lot of them there. <laughs> <laughs> OK. I used them all. <laughs> yes, I about to say, hope for freedom and safe, safe here. Those, those stay with me. And um, how was it for you to get into that in terms of writing? You know, I don't know that I really crossed that much of a boundary. I think I worked with a, you know, a shadow of myself, actually. I like that, the shadow of myself. Who else wants to share? Anybody? Elaine. Elaine, go ahead. I started with a line of how poor is poor. And after trying a paragraph, 
I said, this narrator, it is his finding it impossible to write this from the narrative voice of being a poor person, at least in the sense of being a poor person that is homeless, that is unable to get a job. But there are so many levels of poor in this world, a world in which such a tremendous percentage of its material assets are in the hands of such a small proportion of the population. And then to skip to differently enabled as I increasingly use a cane myself, as I underwent PT for the first time in my life and stood before the steps of the art museum on the uh, mall in Washington, D.C. and realized these buildings were built before legislation existed to enable entry by the handicap, I realized I was grateful for legislation that made it possible to at least open something, but there is so much that still needs to be done. Thank you. And, and I, I heard in your response that that was a difficult task yes. and, to, and to write it down that it was difficult and to acknowledge that is also a step. And so I just wanted to, to acknowledge that that is a step to be conscious and to be aware that, hey, this particular task was a little bit difficult for me. More than a little. Okay. So in our discussion, I just want to wrap up. We have like 15 minutes. Um, so here's some thoughts. Was there a time when you felt uncomfortable talking about race? And I think I heard some of that already. How can you educate yourself about racism without burdening your black friends and family? How to instill inclusive practices at home, work and community? Who built this system and who keeps it? And if you could change one thing in the world, what would you change? So take a question, any question, and maybe we could have a little open discussion about this. So I know for myself, um, I have a hard time um, when it comes to educating myself because there is so much stuff out there. And I just bought this uh, book called, I don't know if anybody can see this. Can you see this? It's called The Black Book. Let me stop sharing for a second so that you can see this. And you see this is called The Black Book. And The Black Book has so much information about the history of people of color from way back before um, the time of Columbus, before uh, in, in Africa and the Gold Coast and about uh, trading and the Africans, how they traded with um, Spain and Europe. And I just want to read something that Toni Morrison wrote. So listen to this. I am the black book between my top and my bottom my right and my left, I hold what I have seen, what I have done, and what I have thought. I am everything I have heard hated, labor without harvest, death without honor, life without land or law. I am a black woman holding a white child in her arms, singing to her own baby lying unattended in the grass. I am all the ways I have failed. I'm the black slave owner, the buyer of golden peacock bleach cream and Dr. Palmer's skin whitening, the self-hating player of the dozens. I am my own nigger joke. I'm all the ways I survive. I am tunmush, whole cake, cook on a hoe. I am 14 black jockeys winning the Kentucky Derby. I am the creator of hundreds of patent invitation, um, inventions. I'm the, I'm the pirate. I'm Maria Latov. I'm Betsy Smith, winning a roller skating contest. I'm quilts and iron work, fine carpentry and lace. I am the wars I fought, the gold I mined, the horses I broke, the trails that I blazed. I'm all the things I have seen. The New York Caucasian newspapers, the scared back of Gordon the slave, 
the draft riots, the darky tunes, the merchants distorting my face to sell thread, so shoe polish and coconut. I am all the things I have never ever loved. I'm supernog, I'm wine, I'm cool baptisms in silent water, dream books and number playing. I am the sound of my own voice singing, sangragi. I am singing, I am ringing shouts, blues, ragtime gospels. I am mojo, voodoo, and gold earrings. I'm not complete here. There is much more. But there is no more time and no more space. And I have journeys to take, ships to name, and crews. Toni Morrison. So tell me, what is it? Where are we? What do you feel? I might respond if I could. Please, so jump in. You had a series of questions up. Here they are. I wanted to say something about, um, because I've been involved personally in issues related to having been traumatized as a child. When uh, you understand how trauma works in the body and the brain, uh, and you don't have to get terribly complicated to get this, uh, the, animal, the animal part of yourself is incredibly captured by frightfulness. I think if more people in the world understood the real uh, consequences of being enslaved and diminished and repeatedly browbeaten into uh, some kind of a position, I think that more people of any color would become, uh, I think the right word is empathic. And that's part of what we need. We need, we need to train our young people to become more empathic. Thank you, David, for that statement. I think that, Justine, I think you might be the youngest person on here. I don't know, maybe not, between you and Emma. In terms of the, the age difference and what you see going on in this world, do you have any different perspective? Oh, I have lots of perspectives, Juanita. Uh, and I think it's a lot of learning from generations before and unlearning. Um, beautiful role models who are in that process of unlearning and recognizing that my peers are at different points in their lives of being empaths and allies and co-conspirators and not ready to recognize their own privileges. Um, it's a lot and could be its own workshop. Um, so, and, and I don't know if that is by right age, location, ability, gender, a, a lot of these identities you've listed earlier, Juanita. So I think this was a perfect exercise to grapple with that and crossing the boundaries. And I'm hearing a lot about generational boundaries here. Yes, yes, absolutely, definitely. Any other kind of responses to- I think Evelyn, ha Evelyn and Janet both have yeah. their hands up and then Jean. Go ahead. Evelyn, go ahead. Yes, hi. I um, was the member of a black church in the 80s. And uh, I am so glad to have had that experience in people's homes, in, uh, in their lives. Um, uh, uh, influenced by their ideas, uh, accepted, accepted. Uh, and um, uh, in my um, experience, uh, time spent with other is, uh, is, a, is a very important means of uh, crossing of the bridge that you speak about. Thank you. Thank you, Evelyn. And um, how long ago was this experience? 30 did, years ago. Did it change how, your perspective? Yes. Okay. 
Um, I uh, uh, got a call from a matriarch from that setting uh, uh, two months ago. Fantastic. Was going through her Rolodex and just, the, uh, you know, wondered if that number still worked for me. And I, you know, based, you know, from this uh, interchange we're having today, I'm thinking, you know, we had a, you know, we had a catch up kind of conversation, but why don't I go and visit her? Okay. You know? Okay. Thank you for that. Who else had, um, who else had the hand up? Uh, I was just going to say, um, first of all, Wendy, it's been a wonderful opportunity to work with all of us here. And I, I just have to hold up that Kirkridge has provided me a lot of um, help with educating myself about racism. They had another wonderful, um, and they have several um, opportunities where you really get to engage and as you've done, really um, imagine in a way, imaginatively taking another, crossing that bridge to another um, identity even. Um, so I just wanted to hold that up in, in gratitude. And um, I loved that you, like one of the ways I've educated myself, as I said, through this and other opportunities, um, the, the not, don't take it personally, like don't disengage because it's hard. That's really helpful. Little, little bits like that I'll hold on to. And I'm very fortunate that in my, um, because of COVID, um, my gay son, who's only 30, going to be 31, is living with us now. And so he can sort of help me, he can be educative too, not just about gay, but his own perspective on um, racism. And so that's been helpful. Um, Thank you for sharing that. Um, who's next, was it Jean? Yep. Yeah. Uh, First of all, Juanita, when I think about a bumper sticker, I think about what you said at the beginning of this, which is, uh, uh, what's the courage walk across the street? And I don't know anyone who, who um, exemplifies that more than you. You are one of the most courageous women I know who are always, you're always willing to cross the street. And it's, it's truly an inspiration for me. Um, I took on um, the person uh, uh, as a young black, and I suppose he became male, um, and and realized uh, the complexity of what this this man was holding, and um, and I and I think what I want to say is I, I would love to have more conversation intergenerationally around race, and one of the reasons I would like to have that is not only to sh sort of trying to figure out, um, my, my niece recently did this really interesting thing. She, she did a knit bombing of Black Lives Matter in Philadelphia, and then she put up a fundraiser for a black organization. And I looked at that and I thought, that took so much courage. And then I thought, I once had that type of courage. I once did those outlandish things. And she reminded me of that, 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 and, and so, so I need the younger generation to talk to my younger person to remember what I used to do and to remind me now that I'm in this place, what is it I can do so that I don't lose my, use my age as an issue, as a reason not to be courageous and really courageous. And, um, so I would love that conversation and I really thank you for this workshop because it, it brought all that stuff up for me. Thank you, Jean. Um, interesting when you said that because I took on a, a white rich man trying to understand that, you know, he, he owns this company. He has this wonderful statement about inclusiveness and racial justice and he's hired a, a, a black female. So he's covered all his bases and he is aware. Um, so what more do you want? And, and the laws have changed. You had your black president. So it, this is, this is his mindset. And I try to put myself there and then we have to have patience with each other. We have to listen and be patient with one another because it takes time and like you said, Jean, you're out there. Yes, I was out there too in the 60s marching with my big Afro and protesting. So this is a, another time to join forces 
with the other generation, the younger generation who's out there marching, maybe because our legs are too tired. And, and maybe we have our bad heart, but we can support our younger um, members in other ways, because we might have a bigger pocketbook than they do. So we can provide some funds, so we can support them through our words and through some of our deeds, but they're gonna be out there in the streets. And, um, and maybe I can't march, but I'm gonna sit down. I'm gonna do something. Uh, actually, I'm riding my motorcycle to, the, to Washington DC for the march in, um, in, in Washington um, in, in August. So I'm actually gonna do that. So it's 429 and I'm really a person about timeliness. I have to start on time, I'm gonna end on time. I'm not gonna waste your time. So we had a, some discussion, we had some writing. Take some of those seeds that I planted and maybe write some more or maybe explore some more and maybe take yourself across the street or next door or pick up the telephone um, like Evelyn said, and reconnect or connect with someone 